Welcome to Social Allo Ministries, where we are committed to glorifying God and exposing the devil. Oh boy, 2 Corinthians 11.14 warns us that Satan sometimes masquerades as an angel of light. 1 John 4.1 tells us to test the spirits because not every spirit is of God. This message is about to break up some of the schemes of the enemy regarding relationships and that end actually all the way through for the glory of God. From the beginning God created man then he sought a suitable helper for the man and he created Eve as a result. The Lord God is the ultimate creator. He's also the ultimate matchmaker. He brought Eve to Adam. He brought Rebecca to Isaac. He brought Esther to King Ashwaras, also known as Xerxes, <laughs> and many others. For example, he also brought Ruth to Boaz. So God is a matchmaker, and he still is. But the enemy tries to play matchmaker. But when he plays matchmaker, it is to the detriment of one or both individuals. In some cases, he sends one of his sons or daughters to be a snare for a son or a daughter of the Lord. And as you can see based on the title of this message, it is primarily geared towards those of you who are in a previous relationship to include a marriage and you're getting maybe prophetic words, sometimes sharp rebukes, or even dreams and or visions relating to someone you used to be in a relationship with. And leaning on 1 John 4, 1, this will help you to test the spirit to see if that spirit is of the Lord or if it is a foul spirit trying to get you into a state of backwardness, trying to get you outside of the will of the Lord to include by using scriptures. In Genesis 3, the devil twisted the scriptures or twisted the word of God in order to leave, lead Eve down the wrong path. And I'll use some other things, other biblical examples of how the enemy will even quote scriptures in an attempt to lead people astray. I've seen many people give these messages then they post it to YouTube for example and they'll direct it towards someone saying the Lord said this person needs to go back to his or her former spouse. And on the surface it seems like a great thing. After all, I mean, God hates divorce. And Jesus did mention in Matthew 5 about divorce and getting married constitutes adultery. And it's not that those things have changed, but we truly have to ensure that we're not just looking at things based on the Word of God. Because like I mentioned before, even the devil will use the Word of God to lead people astray. We have to ensure that it's not simply the Word of God was being led by the Spirit of God. For example, in John 8, the Pharisees, they had legal grounds to put the woman who had been caught committing adultery, to put her to death. But Jesus knew they were doing it based on the wrong spirit. And rather than telling them to execute the woman, he basically said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And as a result, he told the woman, where are those who accuse you? And he said, since they, and I'm paraphrasing, since they do not condemn you, neither do I. But he told her, go and sin no more. So the Lord, he may extend grace in certain situations. So it's not just a matter of knowing what the Word of God says, but which scripture, which word does he want to apply in that situation? Because something goes back all the way to Genesis, correction, Exodus, where the Lord told Moses, I'll have mercy upon whom I'll have mercy, and I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And even like David, David sinned, but the Lord actually put away his sins. I've delivered messages similar to this, and I'll share a little bit of insight regarding what kind of sparked this message. 
I had a dream this morning and in the dream I was actually in the house that I live in and a spirit and this was all happening in the dark as if I was in a relationship with someone whom I used to be in a relationship with <laughs> someone who's never even lived in this house and it was in the dark as if I was still in bed and this person had gotten up and was leaving to go to work and because it was someone I, I am familiar with, that spirit pretending to be the person was making it seem as if this person and I were still in a relationship. Now if the spirit had pretended to be someone else, they maybe would have caught out sooner. And in fact, I had barely fallen asleep when this happened. And when this was going on, I was actually listening to some, um, some music from a psalmist. And the enemy tried coming in on that and trying to plant this little seed but the end was trying to forge a covenant with me but as soon as I got up and I realized what happened I started rebuking that devil and that dream and some of you may have had dreams like that where you find yourself where it's like you're back in time and you're in a relationship with someone and you may misinterpret it as the Lord wants you to go back to that person there are times when the Lord, where you may have gotten divorced and you may think the Lord wants you to go back to that individual and that may not be the case. In Numbers 11, after the Lord had delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, the Lord got angry with them because they started lusting after the things that they experienced in bondage. There are times when the Lord, He basically bends over backwards. He is gracious to a person and He may even allow may allow you to get divorced and people may come at you because the enemy incites them and the enemy is telling them that the Lord is saying that you need to go back to your former spouse when that may not be the Lord's will and if you're having, if you're having dreams that means it, there's a direct spiritual attack and the enemy is trying to get you back into that former relationship that former marriage and what it all points to is backwardsness the enemy does not want you to progress. I've also shared this in another video where many years ago I was asleep. I was, I'd fallen asleep on the sofa and my father called and he shared a dream with me. And I was kind of groggy but I had a little bit of wherewithal to write the dream down. And I was going to check it out later. And the Holy Spirit quickened me and I looked at the dream and I'm like, hold up, there's some things here that had some red flags. And I recently did a video about discerning demonic dreams. And one of the key indicators is when there is any form of lie in the dream, any form of deception. And I got off the phone with my father and I called him back and I asked him for some clarity regarding some things. And then when I was going over the dream of the Holy Spirit, the Lord let me know some, some errors in the dream. And what the enemy was using that dream through my father was to tell me to go back to someone I had been in a relationship with. But one of the things is, I mentioned about Genesis 3 earlier. When the devil came at Eve, Eve already know or already knew not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the enemy likes to come and say, Did God really say? Start casting doubt. Same thing with Jesus, he was like, If you are the Son of God trying to cast doubt. So Eve knew the Word of God. So if the Lord has given you the authorization to get out of a marriage, get out of a relationship, and God's the one who's going to change his mind, and he may even tell you, don't ever go back to this person. If anything comes to the contrary, it could be from a prophet, could be via a dream, it doesn't matter where it comes from. If anything comes from the contrary regarding or opposite of what the Lord has already told you, you are to have a word from the Lord. You are to know that it is not of the Lord. So you truly have to test the spirits. And do not let anyone pressure you. Do not allow the enemy to use anyone to pressure you to go back into a situation that the Lord had delivered you from. I mentioned before, the Lord had delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, but they started lusting after the leeks and the onions and the fish and whatsoever else they were having in Egypt, seemingly forgot, forgetting that in Exodus 3, when the Lord spoke to Moses, he said that he had heard the cries of his people 
they were in bondage. They were crying out to the Lord to deliver them. The Lord delivered them, and next thing you know, they start lusting to go back into that bad situation they were into. And when the enemy knows, basically two things, that relationship to include a marriage that you're in, that it was so bad that if you go back into it, it could be the death of you or the death of what the Lord wants you to do. Another thing is, it may not be that the person that you were with was bad, but that person does not have what it takes to help you do the things the Lord wants you to do. And the Lord has a choice to make. Is he going to continue trying to use you to do that great thing that he's called you to? Or should he choose another? And sometimes the Lord has so much invested in you that if you're willing, he wants to use you to do that great thing. But the devil knows that if you're with that person, that it will also violate a scripture where we're told, and this is more for agrarian society, but do not plow together with a donkey and an ox. So it could be two believers, two people striving towards the Lord, but they're just on different levels. And one would be a donkey, one would be an ox. Different types of callings. And if they're in a relationship, they will progress, but one will never get as far as he or she should have been. Will never fulfill that destiny the Lord had truly ordained for the individual. And another person will become like dead weight. Will come back. So we have to be careful about what the enemy is trying to drag us back into. And he will even use the word of God in an effort to drag us back into relationship. And what he wants is to stall your progress. He is trying to thwart the plans of the Lord. He doesn't want to give you or you to be in a relationship that's going to, where both of you are going to fulfill your godly callings. He wants one or both of you to be a snare unto the other. So if we are receiving a revelation for someone to go back into a relationship, we need to test the spirits to ensure that that spirit is of the Lord. And if we are receiving a direct revelation about going back into a former relationship, we need to ensure that that spirit is of the Lord or else we may find ourselves in a big trap. Also one of the things, the Lord will extend, in a sense, his scepter of grace unto us. There are times when we get ourselves into a bad situation and the Lord will get us out of it. But if we go back into what the Lord delivered us from, he may not be as merciful as before, or he may take his time in, a, in extending his mercy. And we may, we may end up suffering. We may become, in a sense, a needless casualty of war. The Bible tells us those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Sometimes we go astray, but we get a chance to repent and come back in line with the Lord. Some relationships are salvageable. Others are not. And in some cases, you have such a calling on your life that you could say no one else can fulfill that calling. And there are some relationships you cannot be in. Other people, in a sense, they can choose to, for example, marry whosoever they want. You may have such a calling on your life that the Lord will not allow it. So I've done a lot of free talking. I have quoted some scriptures in the process, but now I'm actually going to crack the Bible open. In a sense, I'm going to start following the script. And the first place I'll go is to the book of Hosea. And I'll start in the third chapter. <clears throat> start in the first verse. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So this was after Hosea had married Gomer and she went off with someone else, but now the Lord was telling him to go and get her. So in this case, the Lord was telling him to go get her. So you have to be careful that if you're getting messages, regardless of how you're receiving them, that it is truly the Lord telling you 
to go back to someone. It could be one of the worst mistakes of your life if you do not test the spirits appropriately. So he's telling her, telling Hosea to go and get Gomer, who is seemingly in another relationship, a marriage, whether it's an official marriage or not, but the Lord's calling that man that she's with now her husband. And he's telling him to go redeem her. And says, So I brought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. So even though he had paid the price for Gomer, he went and he's paying the price for her again to redeem her. Then I said to her, You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall have a man, so I also will be toward you. Isn't that something? He has to be telling Gomer to be faithful to him. And it continues, For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. So in this case, not, do we, not only do we see that Hosea is going to redeem or redeemed Gomer, but there is a reason for it. But Hosea being a prophet, this was also significant how he had first gotten that woman and now he's going to redeem her. But this also speaks to how, in a sense, we've all been unfaithful to the Lord. He paid the price for us when he died on the cross. And we've all pursued other gods, whether those gods had names or not. In some cases, the God is the God for herself, where we're doing what sort of pleases us. And he continues to reach out to us to redeem us. Now this kind of gives reasons for why the Lord wanted Hosea to um, go and get Gomer. And I'll say this, in another example, I was on a fast, and I remember exactly where I was, and an impure spirit, a seductive spirit, or a seducing spirit, came to me and wanted me to go back to someone I had been in a relationship with, and then offered an explanation regarding why. And my immediate answer was, no. A couple of things about that, and I'll just specify one. When the Lord tells me to do something, He doesn't come at me like that. When the Lord called me, all He said was minister to the people. I remember one day, I went somewhere, and all the Lord said to me was, get in your car and leave. That was it. He didn't offer me any flower explanations. So it is important to have a personal relationship with the Lord, to know His voice, so that the enemy doesn't come at you. Because the enemy knows, I know the scriptures. And when he comes at me, he, he has to come with scriptures. If not, it's an instant rebuke. So he even tried twisting Hosea 3 in an effort to get me to go back into a relationship the Lord doesn't want me in. I mentioned before, when you have a, relate, or when you have a word from the Lord regarding your future, you stick to that. When anything comes up to the contrary, you rebuke it. Now the Lord had sent the prophet to go get his wife who had gone astray. One of the things about this, I've spoken about forensically looking at relationships. You want to examine how a relationship started. Say for example, you got divorced or you were just in a former relationship. One of the ways to determine if the Lord in fact wants you to go back to that person is to determine if the Lord actually brought you together with that person. I say again, one of the key things to know if the Lord wants you to go back to the person is if he is the one who brought you together in the first place. So whereas I start with Hosea 3, now I'll go to Hosea 1, starting the first verse. The word of the Lord which came to Hosea, the son of Beri, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, 
when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry for the land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. The, I think the King James Version mentioned about selecting a woman of whoredoms. Some Bible translations say a promiscuous woman. So the Lord told him to go and get a promiscuous woman. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. So the Lord told him to go get a promiscuous woman. When the Heavenly Father first sent Jesus, his only begotten Son, he sent, well, first to the Jews, and they were wayward. I know they were the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they had all these laws, but they were out of touch with the Lord. So he sent his Son to go get the Jews who had gone astray. Now, if you're the kind of person where the Lord may offer you, in a sense, kind of explanations regarding why he's doing stuff, then okay. But for others, and most cases I've heard of, the Lord is very matter of fact. If he wants you to do something, he just tells you to do it. And that is it. So in Hosea 3, the Lord told him to go and get his wife. And so in Hosea 1, we know the Lord told him to marry a specific woman, a woman of harlotry. He didn't tell him, tell um, Hosea to marry Gomer. He just gave him a certain description. That's also another thing. Some of you may have made a list regarding, for example, 10 characteristics that you're looking for in a God-ordained spouse. And the Lord may have come back and told you for example, three things to look forward to. So if anyone comes to you and doesn't meet all three of those requirements or how many he gives you, you know that is not of the Lord. And if you were in a relationship before and the Lord gives you, for example, three or four things to look for in that spouse that he has for you, and if that description doesn't match anyone you have been in a relationship with, any kind of signaling about going back to someone you used to be with, you know that is not of the Lord. So again, it is important to test the spirit. So the Lord told Hosea to go and marry or get Gomer to redeem her. And we know that he had told them to be together in the first place. So one of the things about if, the, if you believe others are telling you about the Lord telling you to go back to someone, look at how that relationship started. Also another thing, also look at a person's spiritual condition. And he can make a determination. If you were to go back to that person, would that person hold you back or would that person help you go forward? The Bible tells us that one can put a thousand to flight and two can put 10,000 to flight. So there's a synergistic power in being in a right relationship. The devil has a vested interest in ensuring that you are not in the right relationship. And if you are in a right relationship, to try to break it up. So again, we have to test the spirits. And one of the things why this message is so important is that we do not become messengers of Satan by thinking because, okay, we know scripture says this, that we may even make assumptions if we see someone moving forward with a new relationship that we don't start badgering that person by saying, oh, that's wrong. You need to go back to your former whosoever when that is not in accordance with the Lord's will. So again, we have to be careful whether we're the messenger or the potential recipient. And I've given teachings before about testing the spirits. We have to test the spirits when we are receiving a message from a spirit or before we give a message and also before we receive a message from someone else. Very important. And I'm going to saturate you with several examples, and I'm going back all the way to Genesis. Starting Genesis 16, <clears throat> the Lord had told Abraham that he was going to bless him with a child, or at least many children, and it took quite a while. 
And several years into it, I'll pick up the story in Genesis 16, starting verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now Abram is the name of Abraham before the Lord changed it. And Sarai is the name of Sarah before the Lord changed it. Now, when we're forensically looking at this situation, the Lord had promised Abraham children. At this point in time, he didn't specify that Sarah was going to be the mother. So it seemed plausible. And this was a common practice back then where if a woman couldn't have a child, where this was a form of a surrogate parent. So Sarah, not because the Lord suggested it, but Sarah, because she realized she's getting old, she hasn't had any children, the Lord hasn't blessed her with any children, that maybe if Abraham, or Abram at the time, if he went into Hagar, maybe the Lord allowed them to conceive. And it says, And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now Abram had been hearing from the Lord. Abram didn't go to the Lord and say, Lord, is this in accordance with your will? He simply listened to his wife. There are times to listen to your wife, and there are times not to listen to your wife. In this case, Abram listened. So clearly, this was not of the Lord. Many relationships were never brought together by the Lord. Now, he can bless them, he can redeem them in some cases. So this was clearly a work of the flesh. Abram was listening to his wife. And the enemy likes to get us into a position of desperation where he can come in and try to offer us a way out. But it's something that will cause a sneer. And I continue. After Abram lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarah took Hagar, the Egyptian. And a lot of times in the Bible, Egypt is symbolic of bondage. <laughs> took the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived. Isn't that something? So sometimes the enemy's plans, it works, at least on the surface. And when she, when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. So here we are, it's already causing strife because it was not of the Lord. Works of the flesh is going to reap corruption. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done me be upon you. Now it's not something. He follows his wife. And as soon as he followed and all this stuff, it's really starting to break apart. So again, we have to look at how relationships started. And if you go back, what you're truly going back into. <laughs> and by the way, if you are in a relationship with someone and in the course of ending that relationship, things got real ugly, like maybe the person stalked you, scratched your cars, punched your tires and start doing some crazy mess and call it love. And people are telling you to go back to that person and that person hasn't changed. That's another sign. So we have to be careful about what we're doing because all this stuff sounded good. The Lord hadn't blessed you with children going to Hagar and it worked but it worked and it's already reaping consequences and it goes back to Genesis 3 the devil came and was telling Eve about the moment she ate from the tree she'd be as gods knowing good from evil and later on in Genesis 3 the Lord did say they had become as gods knowing the difference between good and evil but it cost him so much it cost Adam and Eve so much because they listened to the devil I mean, it, it sounded good, but they listened to the devil. And that's something we can't do. Again, he will come in like an angel of light, and he will even quote scriptures. I know some of you may be saying, but you're quoting scriptures, and I don't agree with some of the stuff you're saying. That is perfectly fine with me. 
test the spirits test what I'm saying take everything I'm saying to the Lord <laughs> so again and Sarai said to Abraham may the wrong done me be upon you I gave you my maid into your arms but when she saw that she had conceived I was despised in her sight may the Lord judge between you and me it's already causing strife a key question throughout this whenever you've been lured back into relationship is to think about what you'd be getting into and who is trying to get you into it God or the devil but Abraham said to Sarai behold your maid is in your power to do with her what is good in your sight so Sarai treated her harshly and she fled from her presence it's really causing casualties hmm I tried lightly with this but in some cases the relationship you used to be in you may have had a child or children with that individual and people may be thinking it's best to go back into that relationship for the children but if you go back into a relationship and for example the two of you are fighting like cats and dogs even though somehow cats and dogs are living in peace nowadays but if, if the two of you are, are fighting that may be more harmful for the child than two of you being separated so again examine what you'd be truly getting into by going back into a relationship especially if one or both of you has not changed and if one of you is truly changed by the way <clears throat> one of the things about when you get out of a relationship if you get out of a relationship and as a result of getting out you draw closer to the Lord you bloom you start fulfilling your purpose that lets you know that that relationship was having a negative impact on your life on your relationship with the Lord so again you have to examine a lot of things regarding what you'd be going back into and it continues now the angel of the Lord found her by the by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to shore he said so in this case it was an angel of the Lord and you want to test the spirit if an angel comes to you you want to make sure it's an angel of the Lord and not one of Satan's angels pretending to be an angel of light he said Hagar Sarai's maid where have you come from and where are you going as if he didn't know and she said I am fleeing the angel said her name and even told her about her mistress's name if someone starts speaking to you and already knows about you you have to investigate why they know about you again it may not always be of the Lord and she said I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai then the angel of the Lord and this takes me on to Revelation 12 where it speaks about the devil and his angels fought against Michael and his angels so we truly have to test the spirit whether it's an angel a prophet or whosoever we have to test the spirits not every spirit is of God but in this case it was an angel of the Lord the angel said return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority so in this case angel was telling her to return moreover the angel of the Lord said to her I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count so the angel told her to go back and she did
And she ended up having a son named Ishmael. She ended up having a son named Ishmael. Skipping to verse 17. And by all means, you can read all these scriptures in its full context. I'm just going to isolate certain things for the sake of brevity. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will establish my covenant between me and you. And I will multiply you exceedingly. So first, it was the angel of the Lord who appeared to Abram. And now this time, it says, the Lord appeared to Abram. And the Lord is telling him that he was going to establish his covenant with him. And skipping down to verse 15. Then God said to Abram, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. At this point in time, he had changed Abram's name to Abraham. I will bless her, and indeed, I will give you a son by her. So the Lord had told Abraham in Genesis 12, he was going to make him the father of nations. In Genesis 15, he told him he was going to bless him with a, with a son from his own loins. But in Genesis 16, Abram at the time went along with Sarai and they ended up conceiving Ishmael. But that was not in accordance with the Lord's will. So now the Lord is saying that he's going to establish a covenant with him and he was going to bless him with a son. This is the child the Lord had promised. See, there are times when the enemy wants you to go back to a Hagar, and I use that term synonymously with whether a male or female. The enemy wants you to go back to a Hagar so you can create an Ishmael and you will not have the promises of the Lord. So you have to be careful about that. <clears throat> then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Now isn't it something? kings of people. So this was some greatness where if if they hadn't waited on the Lord this could have been aborted and the enemy will try to get you in the wrong relationship to prevent you from being in the right one. And some of you, you've experienced it where maybe someone new came along and a relationship was just starting and then next thing you know an ex showed up and it seems so enticing. You end up disregarding this new relationship and you went back to the ex. Things were great for a while and then they fell apart. And you got the feeling that you'd been better off pursuing a relationship with the other person rather than the ex that came up at that point that may have seemed like a godsend. But was a work of the devil. And you may have had the same ex coming up to you it seems like every time you're going to move on to a new relationship, the ex comes up. I let that sink in for a while. <clears throat> then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Many people will speak about what happened in Genesis 18 about how Sarah laughed as if Abraham didn't laugh also. But he laughed. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son and you will call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And it hurts me you thinking, some of you saying, but Sarah was his first wife. And in a sense, he's going back to her. 
The Lord always had a plan for them. Hagar was the one who came up and could have potentially thwarted the Lord's plan. So it's not a matter of um, him going back to his original wife. He had never left Sarah. They were always together. It's just that Hagar came into the mist. This was what the Lord had always promised, not a child through Hagar. Hagar was a relationship based on works of the flesh. Things people brought together. What the Lord is saying here, his covenant, and in the New Testament it speaks about how Ishmael was a child of the flesh and Isaac was a child of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So this here speaks about who the Lord had his original tent, intent for a covenant with. So the Lord said that his covenant was going to be with Isaac. And a part of this, the contention, people say, well, Ishmael was the firstborn son. He had the legitimate rights. But despite all that, the Lord said his covenant was going to be with Isaac. So this is why we need the full counsel of God. Because, yeah, in the scriptures speak about the firstborn son having certain rights. But there are several places in the scriptures where we see it wasn't the firstborn who got those rights. It wasn't the firstborn who was the most blessed. So in this case, the Lord's covenant was going to be with Isaac. Now, there was some deception involved with this, but Jacob was a twin brother, but he was a younger one, and he ended up being more blessed. Jacob ended up becoming Israel. He was more blessed than his brother Esau. And I won't go into it, but Esau, he ended up marrying women to the displeasure of his parents. His calling was not that of Jacob. Jacob ended up marrying people within his bloodlines. So there are things about things being in accordance with the Lord's will. And by that, I don't mean that Leah was in accordance with the Lord's will. Rachel was a woman he should have, been, should have married. But that's another thing. Also, um, Jacob, later named Israel, had 12 sons. The most favored among those 12 sons was Joseph. He was the one who was sent ahead of them in Egypt that end up saving the entire family and many other families. Joseph was the 11th born son, but he was the most favored. Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And on the day when Israel was conferring the blessings, it was the younger who was blessed more than the older. So even though there's scripture saying certain things, we need the full counsel of God that we're using things of the spirit because rather than saying, oh, the firstborn son should be entitled to these, it is what the Holy Spirit is saying. So it's not just about having the words of God, but what is the Holy Spirit saying? We need the Holy Spirit. So with Hagar, Ishmael was a work of the flesh. With Isaac, he was going to be a work of the Holy Spirit. And it continues. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes and how I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, but my covenant. So even though Ishmael was first, it's kind of like you may have had a first wife or a first husband. The Lord's covenant may be with the person you're with now or someone that he has for you in the future. It says, But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. So we see the Lord with the Holy Spirit giving these revelations. We don't see the Lord anywhere in the story of um, Hagar and Ishmael until Hagar actually fled. Again, entirely works of the flesh. So we truly have to dissect things regarding where we're being led. 
into works of the flesh or works of the spirit. <clears throat> when he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. The Lord did in fact bless them with that son. And I'll skip ahead to Genesis 21. Starting verse 1. <clears throat> then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did it for Sarah as he had promised. So again, when you have a word of the Lord, that is very important. When you have a word of the Lord, anything that comes up contrary, not of the Lord. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to them. So Abraham was a hundred, Sarah was ninety. It seemed impossible. It's one of those things pointing to the hand of God. When you're testing the spirit, you're looking for the hand of God in certain things. Actually, in everything. <laughs> Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. So when Hagar was pregnant, there was contention. It started causing problems. But now here we have a promise a fulfillment of the word of the Lord coming to pass and she said God has made laughter for me so this brought joy the blessings of the Lord they bring joy he adds no sorrow with it so the enemy will try to bring you something that looks like a blessing but when you partake of it it will bring you destruction it will add sorrow and it's like as soon as you get to a certain point it hits you hmm And she said, <clears throat> Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. She's just so happy. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham was and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking. When you do the things of the devil, he will make a mockery of you. You go back into that relationship that the Lord had delivered you from, it may start off great, and then it turns sour, and the enemy will start mocking you. And he'd be like, I got ya. So you have to ensure that you're testing the spirits, and that where you're being led back into is truly of the Lord. If it's something like Hosea, where the Lord is telling you to go back, then by all means. If it's like how the angel of the Lord told Hagar to go back, then by all means. But also keep that in mind. The angel told Hagar to go back. The Lord said that he would bless Ishmael. And it's similar to how he would bless Isaac with Jacob and Jacob had those 12 children so Ishmael he would have 12 sons so there are similarities but there are also subtle differences because Jacob or correction um, Israel no, <laughs> excuse me Isaac is the one whom the Lord was going to make his covenant with not Ishmael so even though blessed Ishmael or correction Isaac will be more blessed so there are certain things where the Lord may bless it, but it doesn't mean that it's the full potential. So be careful about what you're getting back into. So the Lord, you may end up going back into something. The Lord may bless it, 
but it wouldn't be as blessed as if you'd waited for what the Lord truly had in store for you. Continuing, now Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, again, Egyptian, think bondage, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. Now isn't that something? Genesis 16, it was Sarah who told Abraham about going into Hagar, and now Sarah is regretting it. So you follow the ideas of the devil. You are going to regret it. You are going to regret it. Hmm. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. <clears throat> but God said to Abraham, now isn't it something? Initially, with Hagar and Ishmael, the Lord didn't speak to Abraham, and Abraham didn't inquire for the Lord. It is very important for you to inquire for the Lord before making moves, especially when it comes to relationships. <laughs> and especially if that relationship involves going back to someone. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. Hmm. So before the Lord didn't say anything, but now he's saying something. If you were in a relationship and you're not out of the relationship and your relationship with the Lord has magnified you're doing great things for the Lord he has an investment in you now he wants to ensure that any relationship that you get into that it is a right relationship and that you do not go back into something so initially the Lord didn't say anything but now he's telling Abraham to actually listen to his wife initially Sarah gave him some bad advice about going to Hagar. He should not have listened to that. But now the Lord is telling him to listen to his wife. And the son of the maid, I will make a nation also, because he is your descendant. So it's kind of like this. Again, the Lord can bless things that you get into, but it won't be as blessed as if you get into something that he wants you to get into. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar putting them on her shoulder and gave her the boy and sent her away and she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba so the Lord agreed with Sarah that despite all the history and in the child that Abraham had with Hagar, that he should put her away. And it may seem cold now, to put someone away that you have a child with, to put someone away that you have a history with. The Lord was going to take care of them. So the Lord told him to put, put him away. I go to Genesis 25. And this was after <clears throat> Sarah had died. Abraham got into another relationship. Now this seems like it would be a good time that if she was available for Abraham to get into a relationship with Hagar and to bring Ishmael back. But in Genesis 25, look at what happened. Now Abraham took another wife whose name was K. 
Keturah, not Hagar. When Abraham put away Hagar and Ishmael, it was for good. There was no going back. I say it again. When he put away Hagar, it was for good. There was no going back. So please be careful about anyone or anything trying to tell you to go back to someone that is not in accordance with the Lord's will. So Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letushim, and Lumimim. And the sons of Midian were Ephah and Epher, and Hanok, and Abida, and Eldaah. All those were the sons of Keturah. A lot of times we think about Abraham and we think about him just having two sons. So he had one son with Hagar, Ishmael, had one son with, <laughs> had what, <laughs> something just hit me, had one son with um, Sarah, Isaac, and here we have Keturah, and they had six sons. So even more fruitful. So there are times when the Lord calls us to move forward, and as we move forward, we become more fruitful. But throughout all this, however, the Lord's covenant still remained with Isaac. It says, Now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. All that he had to Isaac. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave, gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of of the east. So you notice, Ishmael was the one who the Lord was going to establish his covenant with. Ishmael, or just in case I messed it up, Isaac was the son the Lord was going to establish his covenant with. Ishmael was put away, making room for Isaac. Those six sons from Keturah they were also pushed away, making room for Isaac. Be careful about those who are trying to come and be a part, partaker of blessings that the Lord has ordained for you and ordained for you and another. And skipping down to verse 9. Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him, Abraham, in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, facing Mamre. And I'll stop there. So even though they were apart, Isaac and Ishmael had some form of relationship. So if you used to be in a relationship, it doesn't mean that person becomes public enemy number one or you can't communicate at all. But that doesn't mean you should be in a relationship going forward. That may not be what the Lord has for you. So again, we have to be testing the spirits throughout all this. Because the enemy can truly use someone to be a snare. An example of how the enemy will use someone to be a snare is in 1 Samuel 18, start verse 20. Now Michal, Saul's daughter loved David. When they told Saul, the thing was agreeable to him. Saul thought, I will give her to him that she may become a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David, for a second time, you may be my son-in-law today. 
King Saul had initially offered his um, older daughter Mirab to David, but David refused. But when Saul found out that his younger daughter, Michal, loved David, she wanted to give David to the future king as his wife. But it was for a good reason. It was so she could become a snare unto him and the Philistines would be against him. It was a setup. So even though it was a marriage, Saul was seemingly a man of God, anointed by the Lord to be the king. David was a man of God. Likewise, you have to be careful where even if your preacher is coming into you and saying, God said this is the one he has for you, you have to be careful that that preacher, that prophet, that whatsoever is truly representing the Lord's interests for your life. Was Matthew 16? There was a point when Peter rebuked Jesus. And then Jesus looked at Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to me. And told him that his concerns were of men and not of God. So you have to be careful where even someone who's anointed is coming to you and say, Oh, I saw in a dream, or the Lord said this. You have to make sure it's the Lord. It may seem like a good thing. I mean, David was an Israelite, Michal was an Israelite, Saul was an Israelite. It seemed as if they all loved God. But Saul wanted to give him a call to him to be to David, so she become a snare unto him. And a part of how he was going to use her to ensure that the Philistines would be against David was because he wanted David to pay a dowry by using, and it's gross, by killing a hundred Philistines. Because that's what it would take to get a hundred Philistine foreskins to pay for Michal as a dowry. I wasn't planning on going there, but I also say this. In 1 Samuel 6, 6, 17, when David was going to confront and later kill Goliath, he asked what was the reward. Some of the rewards were tax-free living for him and his family. Also, he was supposed to marry the king's daughter. There was no additional requirements. He didn't have to kill anyone. But Saul wanted him to go to the Philistines to kill a hundred of them so that David would become detestable unto them and they would be after David. So it was a setup. So what kind of hoops does the enemy want you to jump through in order to be with someone so that that person can be a snare unto you? So that, that person can turn... Oh my Lord. This is how wicked things can get. David ended up killing not only 100, but 200 Philistines, brought their foreskins, married Michal. And one thing about their relationship, they had no children. David had children with many wives, but not with Michal. Also as a part of this, Michal ended up getting, David ended up getting sent into exile. He ran away. Saul spitefully gave David's wife, Michal, to another man, Faltiel. So there are all kind of problems coming from this relationship. It was not in accordance with the Lord's will. In fact, even though the relationship started off wrong, the Lord ended up blessing it in the end. But Solomon ended up becoming David's successor. But even that relationship is a testimony of God's grace. But David went about that one the wrong way. So we have to be careful about testing the spirits. And I mentioned Solomon. And some of you may have heard what I said a while ago and be like, but that doesn't seem like a bad thing. I mean, David, that relationship started off wrong and the Lord ended up using Solomon to replace David. Well, one of the things with Solomon, his relationship with the Lord was a little bit different. And we see this in um, 1 Kings 11, starting verse 1. After David had died, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, 
and Hittite women. Isn't that something? From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you. For they will surely turn your heart away from turn away your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. We have to be careful. David, he went after Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. Bathsheba was actually married to Uriah the Hittite. And it is famous how they David ended up committing adultery with her. So the relationship started off wrong. David lusted after her. The relationship started off wrong. So here we have Solomon lusting after other women, just like his father did. There are consequences about being in a wrong relationship, where even if the Lord blesses it, some curses may come along with it. So yes, the Lord did bless the relationship. But as a result of how Solomon was conceived, and even David mentioned about him being conceived, David himself being conceived in iniquity, Solomon, the relationship started off wrong, so we have to be careful about those kind of things. So even though the Lord blessed the relationship and made Solomon king in David instead, there were some consequences, so we have to be careful. We truly want to be in step, in alignment with the Lord's will. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. I told of a thousand women. And his wives turned his heart away. And it's one of the things the Lord is truly trying to stop. Anyone from turning the heart of his children away from him. So even though the Lord blessed Solomon, there's still some consequences. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashereth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. And I remind you, I mentioned about how David started off an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. There were some consequences as a result of that. Their first child died. Their second child, Solomon, the Lord chose him as David's successor. The Lord even chose Solomon to build his temple. And after all of that, we're still seeing these things with Solomon. I've said it in, I have a three-part series about how to identify your God-ordained spouse and the counterfeits. And one of the things I said in one of those videos is that when a relationship starts off wrong, more than likely it's going to end wrong. <clears throat> so again, Solomon built the temple of God. But in verse 7, Then Solomon built a high place to Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain of which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives. So the man who built the temple of God was building idols for other gods, place of worship, worship for other gods, who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon. Hmm. There's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. Hmm. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods 
but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nonetheless, or nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Solomon had a son named Rehoboam, and at that point in time, the Lord tore the kingdom and gave the ten northern tribes to Jeroboam. Jeroboam ended up becoming a wicked king and a king over Israel. Most of Israelite kings were wicked. So because of Solomon's thing, see, it started off wrong and all this stuff, it just a snowball effect. So we truly need to be in accordance with the Lord's will. So even though the Lord blessed Bathsheba and David with a second child after Uriah died, and he made Solomon the king in David's stead, allowed Solomon to build his temple, you have all this stuff coming up in the back end. And these are the things that we need to avoid. So yes, the Lord may bless it, but when the Lord blesses something that start off wrong, a work of the flesh, it is not going to be the same as if we do things the Lord's way, as if we wait on Him and for His will. I mentioned about how, the, <clears throat> how Saul wanted to give Michal to David to be a sneer unto him. Also Solomon, how because he married those women, that they became a sneer to him, led him away from the Lord his God. The devil wants to put you in a relationship with someone. It could even be a fellow Christian who will take your heart away from the Lord, where maybe you won't be on fire for the Lord, where you become a lukewarm Christian. And Jesus said that those who are lukewarm, he'll spit out of his mouth. So the enemy knows these things, and he will even try to get you another Christian, someone who's lukewarm, someone who will end up pulling you down as opposed to pushing you forward, propelling you forward. In 1 Kings 16, start verse um, 28. <clears throat> so Amri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria and Ahab his son became king in his place. Now Ahab the son of Amri became king over Israel in the 30th year of Asa king of Judah and Ahab the son of Amri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Ahab the son of Amri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. As I mentioned before, after the Lord split the nation of Israel into the ten northern tribes of Israel and the two southern tribes were, you had Judah, most of the Israelites, Israelite kings were wicked. They did evil in the Lord's sight. So we see that Ahab was evil. But it continues. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, Jeroboam who was the first king over Israel, that he married Jezebel, the daughter, daughter of Ethbaal, whose name also means with Baal, not a good sign, the king of the Sidonians, modern day Lebanon, and went to serve Baal and worship him. So again, because he married the wrong person, not only was he wicked before, now he's going to do even more detestable things in the Lord's sight. This is the kind of marriage that the devil wants to get you into. Something to take you away from the Lord. Either were you not going to be on fire for the Lord as before, or you just go that opposite way, period. So he 
erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So in verse 30 of 1 Kings 16, it tells us that Ahab was evil. But because he married Jezebel, he became even more wicked. That's what the enemy would like to do for you. And he will have someone packaged as if that person is a blessing, but the person is a curse. And one of his most effective weapons is someone from the past. Is someone from the past. I flipped to the book of Ruth. This is an example of someone the Lord brought together. <clears throat> there, was a, there was a famine in Bethlehem, Judah. Naomi and her husband went to Moab. Her two sons, Malon and Kilian, <clears throat> sorry, I lose my voice. <clears throat> Malan and Kilion, or Chilion, married two women. But those sons end up dying along with Naomi's husband. Naomi heard about prosperity back in Bethlehem, Judah. So she decided to return to her homeland. And in Ruth 1, start verse 8. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go! Return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons would you therefore wait until they were grown would you therefore refrain from marrying no my daughters it is harder for me than for you for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So I paused. This was an example of going back. So Ruth was telling them, or correction, Naomi was telling Orpah and Ruth, it's more advantageous to go back to your home. Go find husbands there. And she was saying the hand of the Lord was against her, not knowing the Lord was actually with her. So this is an example of how Naomi, she truly had their best interest at heart, but she was telling them to go back and find husbands from their past. Hmm. Oprah kissed her and left. But Ruth, and this is part of why we call this book the book of Ruth. Then she said, Behold, this is Naomi. Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. If my memory serves me right from what I read about Solomon, <clears throat> Chemosh was the god of the Moabites. 
And Naomi was telling Ruth to go back with Orpah. Go back to your people and your gods. The enemy would love for you to go back to your past if it's not advantageous to what the Lord has for you. Sometimes your future lies in your past and sometimes it does not. And you need the Spirit of the Lord to help you discern the difference. So if you keep on having dreams about being in a former relationship, it could be the enemy trying to tie you into backwardness. Or it could be the enemy trying to lock you up in a marriage spiritually. Oh, those foul spirits. <clears throat> but Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do with me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw, Naomi that is, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So, um, Naomi and her husband, Eli Melech, went to Moab because of a famine in Bethlehem, Judah. Their two sons, Malon and Chilion, married women. Chilion married Orpah. Malon, Ruth, both, both first sons died, her husband died, and in returning to Bethlehem, Judah, she had her daughters-in-law with her. She encouraged them to go back, like the enemy tries to encourage you to go back. Orpah agreed. Now there's something I heard about what happened to Orpah, but it has not been verified, so I won't repeat it, but it wasn't good. But we know for sure, for sure what happened with Ruth. Because she went forward as opposed to backward, she walked into the blessings of the Lord. In Ruth chapter 2, she ended up marrying Boaz. Or she ended up meeting Boaz and they did end up getting married. And by the way, Ruth was married to Malon. They had no children. And not to say that people were married and they don't have any children, that the relationship is fruitless. But in this case, I'll say, Ruth was married to Malon. They had no children, so the relationship was fruitless. She went to Bethlehem, Judah, moved forward as opposed to going backwards. And look what happened. And this is phenomenal. In Ruth chapter 4, starting verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. So when Ruth was, was married to Malon, they had no children. It harkens back to when David, he married Michal, they had no children. And this is not about childbirth. Sometimes this means giving, giving birth to a ministry. Sometimes the Lord has something in a person, regardless of what, what that is. Whether it's something natural, spiritual, the Lord has something in a person. And it requires being with the right person to unlock that, to give birth to that ministry, to give birth to that child. And if those two aren't together, that thing will not be birthed. And the enemy's trying to abort that birth, so he'll try to get a person back into a bad situation. Ruth, married to Malon, no children. Malon died. She marries Boaz. And she gave birth to a son. Isn't that something? What is the enemy trying to abort by having you go back into something that will not bear fruit like what the Lord has waiting on you? So again, we have to be careful about telling people, oh, the Lord said, or you need to go back to your, what, hmm, we have to be careful because we may be trying to thwart the Lord's plans. 
and it may not seem right to us, but if the Holy Spirit is saying it, and it, he's tying it to scriptures, I continue. <clears throat> then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Hmm. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor woman gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez was born Hezron. To Perez was born Hezron. And to Hezron was born Ram. And to Ram, Aminadab. And to Aminadab was born Nashon. And to Nashon, Salmon. And to Salmon was born Boaz. And to Boaz, Obed. And to Obed was born Jesse. And to Jesse, David. It mentions Salmon. Salmon married Rahab. <laughs> they called her the harlot who was in Jericho. And even she was redeemed, moved from her past and into the future with Salmon. Now these names that are mentioned, all of this happened because Ruth would not return to her past, would not go back to her past situation to try to find a husband, but would move into her future. And as a result, she met the man that the Lord had for her. And the Lord blessed their relationship. Now in Ruth, Ruth's case, she was a widow. She was married to Naomi's son, Malon. They'd been married and they didn't have any children. It's kind of like how the Lord didn't bless Michal and David with any children. David had children with other women to include concubines, but not Michal. The devil would love for people to go back into a situation where they become basically barren, whether physically or spiritually barren, where they go into a situation where they basically abort the plans of the Lord, where they're never as fruitful as the Lord intended them to be if they'd only followed the Lord's plans. So again, we have to be careful where if we think we receive a revelation, or worse of all, we just go off the flesh because we know that certain scriptures say certain things that we believe that the Lord is applying that or those scriptures to a particular person's situation without being led by the Holy Spirit. And we start speaking from the flesh, giving soulish prophecies because we know, well, Matthew 5 says this, or whatever the case may be. We have to be led by the Spirit of God to be the sons of God. Also, Peter wrote in his epistle about prophecy of old was not by the will of man but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit so in a lot of ways we have to test the Spirit ensure that we're not being led by our flesh even if we know some things out of Scripture it's kind of like the Pharisees and the Sadducees I mean they knew the Scriptures but they didn't know Jesus which meant they didn't know God and that's part of the reason why Jesus would say have you not read? And it was an insult because they were reading the scriptures. They knew what to look for in the Messiah. And Messiah was right in front of them and they couldn't recognize. It was a spiritual thing. I mentioned Matthew 16 earlier. Peter, he rebuked Jesus because the devil was using him. But prior to that, when Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? And they were saying like Jeremiah, Elijah, oh, that other prophet. And then the Lord said, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, the Father in heaven had revealed it to him by the Holy Spirit. 
we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will also help us if people are saying things that are not of Him. And we'll see an example of that later, how someone used the word, quoted scripture, but it was not of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, it was sh shut down and shut down. So all these things here, because Ruth didn't go back to her past, but went into her future. Now I'll say this, sometimes our future does lie in our past. But there are times when we're just too dependent on the past that we're not moving into the future. So we need the Holy Spirit to discern the difference. All these names that are given, Pirins, Pires, Hezron, Nashon, Aminadab, Salmon, Obed, Jesse, David. These names are repeated in Matthew chapter 1, where we have the genealogy of Christ. And I'll just read, um, hmm, I'll just read verse 5 of Matthew 1 for now, where it says, Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse. When you go through this um, genealogy of Christ, there are very few women who are listed because Ruth did not go back to her past but move into her future, met Boaz. Her name is listed in the geneal genealogy of Christ. One of the few women. You have Rahab, speaks about Ruth. <laughs> it even speaks about Bathsheba. And then we have Mary. In this example here, is a true example of when either the Holy Spirit or another member of the heavenly host gives a revelation about going back to something or staying in a certain situation. But even with this, there are many ways of confirming that this was truly the word of the Lord. Because like I started off with 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4, or 14 correction, it speaks about Satan masquerading as an angel of light. So you have to be careful. But in Matthew 1, starting verse 18, it states, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed, or betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, as you can imagine, when Mary was telling Joseph that yes, she was pregnant and the child was of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> Joseph wasn't buying that. <laughs> and Joseph, her husband, he says her husband, even though they were only engaged, but an engagement back then was more serious than it is now, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. He was going to quietly divorce her, give her a writ of divorcement call off the engagement but when he had considered this behold an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying Joseph son of David do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us and Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus a couple of things about this so Joseph was going to divorce Mary 
once he found out that she was pregnant and this thing about the Holy Ghost oh that was a flying but there are different ways of confirming this the angel spoke to him and said Mary would give birth to a son so if, I, if Mary had given birth to a girl that would have meant that was not an angel of the Lord but even before that there are different ways of confirming it the story told in Luke 1 the angel of the Lord Gabriel appeared to Mary and when he told her about the Lord's going to bless her with a child, the Messiah, and to call him Jesus, he also told her of her cousin Elizabeth, Zacharias' wife, who was pregnant with John the Baptist. And when she went to go visit Elizabeth, Elizabeth prophesied to her and told her about blessed is the fruit of her womb and basically reiterated the things that Gabriel had said to her. And this was before there was even a conversation for Elizabeth to have any kind of knowledge except via the Holy Spirit that Mary was carrying the Messiah. So besides a sense of peace of having truly spoken with an angel of the Lord or heard from an angel of the Lord, Joseph could have inquired of Elizabeth for confirmation but then again with family sometimes you have to be careful. I mentioned about like a pastor earlier when I mentioned about King Saul you have to be careful that people aren't trying to lead you astray because they're trying to advance their selfish agenda or they're looking out for someone more than they're looking out for the word of God coming to pass in your life. So there are a bunch of things to confirm that it was actually an angel of the Lord that had spoken with him. In this case, it was an angel. He stayed and things worked out wonderfully. In fact, after Jesus was born, and King Herod was persecuting or actually killing infant boys two years and under an angel appeared to him again told Joseph to go to Egypt and stay there until he told him to return so that was a true angel of the Lord giving Joseph guidance regarding remaining in the relationship and the devil is not beyond masquerading as an angel of light sending one of his fallen angels to try to deceive people so we always have to test the spirit and a part of testing the spirit regarding any angelic being is to ask about if how, basically how they feel about Jesus if he is the son of God who came here in the flesh died on the cross do they call him Lord etc etc testing the spirit but many people are doing things out of their flesh because they know certain things are in scripture and they think that that's what the Lord wants to do with certain people but they're falling into the enemy's snares and again if the Lord has given you a a message a prophecy regarding what he has planned for you if he has described the person that he has in store for you and someone's trying to lead you in a different direction no 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 as I said before the enemy is not against using scriptures the enemy is not even opposed to appearing in your dream manifesting like Jesus himself to try to get you to do something so you always have to test the spirit and sometimes you may feel uneasy you may have doubt if that is Jesus or not you have an encounter with Jesus you won't have any doubts whether that was Jesus or not so as I mentioned the devil is not opposed to using the word of God to lead people astray in Genesis 3 he asked Eve did God really say and he got her twisted but again the enemy will use scriptures this, that's why we have to be careful that just because something has a scripture associated with it or people are quoting scripture if it doesn't come with the backing of the Holy Spirit if it's not bearing witness to the Holy Spirit in you if you can't go to the Lord and ask for independent confirmation discard it reject it when the devil tried tempting Jesus and I use the, the account from Matthew 4 in Matthew 4 starting verse 5 the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him if you are the son of God throw yourself down for it is written he 
will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone now this is Matthew 4 in Matthew 3 Jesus had been filled with the Holy Spirit so Satan coming and quoting scriptures that was not gonna be enough of course Jesus knew who he was and not to trust anything that comes out of his mouth Jesus said to him on the other hand it is written you shall not put the Lord your God to the test so be careful about the enemy or a messenger of Satan whether a human or a spirit trying to get you to go back into a relationship that is going to be detrimental to your relationship with the Lord to your progress in doing the things the Lord has put you on this earth to do and in some cases it could very well cost you your life because some people have gone back into a relationship from the past and not only did it kill their ministry it cost them their lives because the other person was like now that they have you back they, they're never gonna let you go so we truly have to be careful that if we're encouraging someone to go back into a relationship that the Holy Spirit of the Lord truly directed such actions if we were listening to a voice that's telling us to go back into a relationship that it is truly of the Lord Again, the Lord did many incredible things to get the Israelites out of Egypt. And when they were in the wilderness, they started lusting after the things from back in Egypt, seemingly forgetting the bondage they were in. If the Lord got you out of a relationship that you were in absolute bondage, He's not going to send you back, especially back into that same situation where you have progressed, gotten closer to him in a way it would, would have never happened in the situation you're in before. The Lord is not going to send you back into that hell because some relationships are hell. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In everything that you're doing ensure that the Holy Spirit is guiding you is leading you into all truth give a lot of examples about relationships those that were of God as opposed to works of the flesh glorified the Lord and actually brought people joy Sarah when she did a work of the flesh and encouraged her husband to go into Hagar it created Ishmael the enemy loves to create Ishmael's works of the flesh or he loves to lead people into a place of barrenness he loves to pull people back into bondage that's why sometimes you may have dreams and it may not be about relationships where you find yourself like back in high school back in grade school back in a former job things are always relating to the past There are some relationships where being in the relationship, for example, puts a person at risk to sin. It may put a person at risk to commit adultery, whether by lusting after other people or put the person in a position to actually commit adultery in the physical form. Or could even put a person in position to the person may in, in, engage in self-pleasure, masturbation, 
And the enemy, knowing those things, will try to get you back into a relationship like that. Where you'll be living in sin, one way or another. It's like, you can be married, things may seem okay on the outside, but you're engaging in those kind of secret sins because your heart is not where it is meant to be and your eyes start looking elsewhere whether out to others you may open the door for pornography so if you're in a relationship even if you're married and you're engaging in um, sexual acts that was defiling the marital bed if you're in that kind of relationship, that kind of marriage, then the enemy will try to pull you back into that so that you'll be living in sin. Again, the enemy is very calculated. So you have to look at what he's trying to get you back into, if it is him. And if in testing the spirits to see if something's of the Lord, what would you be getting back into? The angel of the Lord at one point told Hagar to go back to Sarah. She went back. It worked out for a while, but eventually, Sarah, after she had her child, ended up telling Abraham to put away Hagar. So in the long run, it didn't work out. So we have to test the spirits. I said a lot. This is a long teaching. I may take some heat around some, from some people. And, um, Based on some activity that went on while recording this video, I know the kingdom of darkness doesn't like it, but I'm the wrong person to mess with. I'm the wrong person to mess with. The Lord has sharpened me like a sword that will pierce the enemy through. And I don't tolerate the enemy trying to play games with me in my future. Caleb and Joshua they had a different spirit. They wanted to move forward into the promised land. They didn't want to go back to Egypt. They didn't want to die in the wilderness. They wanted to go into the promised land. Fix your eyes forward. Forward and upwards, where your help comes from. Keep it focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, where he wants you to go, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, who will guide you into all truth. Everyone may not agree with it, but the Lord will send confirmation one way or another. And he will also take it to a scripture, his words regarding which scriptures he wants to apply at that time. He had me use a lot of scriptures in this. And I've kind of done videos like this before, but this was a little bit different. But it also speaks about how the Lord can point you different scriptures at different point in time to make a certain point. Be careful about the enemy trying to take you back into the past because he knows that if you go back there, you will never be who the Lord had intended for you to be. The Lord is calling you to move forward and the enemy wants you to move backward. It's kind of like how when you become saved, you become a new creation in Christ Jesus because the blood cleanses all sin and unrighteousness and all your sins have passed away and the enemy keeps on trying to bring up stuff from your past trying to bring up people to get you back into doing old habits and sometimes people with just friendships if they maintain certain friendships they, they go back to their old ways the same thing applies to relationships even more so because that person is very influential in your life if it is a situation the Lord delivered you from, you have grown closer to the Lord, that person has not, be very careful about going back. Test the spirits to ensure they're of God. To include, test the spirits behind the message, this message, I have been led to convey. I pray the Lord blesses you. And if you got ensnared by the enemy, where the Lord delivered you and you're back in, Cry out to the Lord, because I pray that he delivers you again. And if the enemy has stolen anything from you, I pray the Lord restore all the years the locust has eaten, and of course, at Joel 2.25.
and anything he missed out upon that by his grace he will work out all things so that you won't lose time and he'll take you to where he had intended you to be in the name of Jesus for his glory Jesus is Lord he's coming soon the enemy's time is short so he's fighting dirty so we have to stick close to the Lord know his ways know his voice Jesus said that his sheep know his voice not only his words but his voice the devil Matthew 4 Luke 4 he quoted scriptures from Psalm 91 so it's not about knowing the word it's about knowing his voice the Holy Spirit the Spirit who leads you to all truth and Jesus is the truth He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. May the Lord be forever glorified in your life. Amen.